Shagheads, Curtis Tucker here for another exciting episode of A Shaggy Life. And I appreciate you guys sticking with me, even though I have not been getting episodes out on a consistent basis. Uh, A lot of traveling, a lot of stuff going on, uh, trying to keep up with some other things. Uh, Pretty soon, things are going to start slowing down, and I am going to get all of this stuff done. Uh, I'm going to get these podcasts done weekly. I'm going to get my book really going. I'm going to get my art going. I'm going to get my lifestyle brand going. And so uh, don't give up on me. I am still here and just uh, appreciate you guys listening. I know uh, Dave's out there. Dave was asking about... uh, uh, kind of has fun listening to these episodes. Uh, they're just kind of random about what's going on in my life and the Shaggy Duck life and uh, stuff like that. So tonight, um, I thought I would talk about a subject that has become really important in my life and, and a lot bigger than I ever imagined it. And if a lot of you are out there, so I am 61 years old. So anybody basically younger than 60, I'm going to guess has probably not thought of tonight's subject much, but maybe after listening to this, maybe you'll uh, start thinking about it a lot earlier than I did. And so so basically turning um, 61 and losing my mom. So my dad had already passed. My mom passed a, a couple of years ago. My father-in-law had passed away the year before. And father-in-law and mom both passed away at 81 years old, and they basically both, uh, you know, were at the point where they weren't doing very good physically. If they fell down, they couldn't get up. Um, They were sitting in chairs for long periods of time, not doing anything. Uh, Just, you know, just kind of watch them deteriorate, and I think that's what started me thinking about this. So basically, but what really hit home was... uh, being over 60 years old, having all of your parents and parent-in-laws and everybody gone, knowing that you all of a sudden are the old generation and your kids and grandkids are now all of a sudden relying on you and you're the one that they go to for holidays and advice and, and things like that. So that got me thinking. And the one thing that I I started thinking about was I don't, so so I'm 20 years away from when my mom and father-in-law passed away. And so I'm thinking, oh, wow, do I only have 20 years of life left? I mean, you know, when you're, when you hit 60, that's something you start thinking about. And I'm thinking, no, I don't, I don't feel like I've only got 20 years uh, left. You know, it feels like uh, I should have a lot more than 20 years. And so what I have done Uh, and this is going to sound silly, but uh, it's all part of this plan, is I've kind of decided that my goal is to live to be 102 years old. Of course, I like the number two. I want to make it to 100, so I just figured let's throw 102 out there. And so that basically now gives me 40 more years to live. Well, to make it 40 more years, there's going to have, I'm going to have to do some things to make it to that 40 years. And, and so another thing that I've decided is, and, and, you know, I know there's going to be certain reasons I won't make it to 102, which would be like an accident, some unknown disease, a uh, rare disease that I don't know that I have. Um, you know, like I said, accidents, just things, things that are out of my control. But if everything goes to plan and, and, I live, you know, just based on the things that I do to help myself and my longevity, then there, there's a really pretty good chance that I can live to be however old I want to be. And so, so my goal, my plan is 102 years old. And then my second goal is to be able, so I run, I'm 61 and I run every morning. And when I say run, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, steady, slow run, but I run three and a half miles in the morning and then I speed walk another three and a half. So I'm out every morning for seven miles. And I feel like at 61, that's nothing. I mean, I can do that in my sleep. I can do it every morning. There, it, it just, it's easy. It doesn't take much effort to do that. And so I see myself being able to do that at 81. So I've kind of made myself a promise that I'm going to be, when I turn 81, 
that will be the age that my mom and father-in-law passed away at in poor health. And I promised myself that at 81, I will be out on that trail or wherever I'm living at the time. Hopefully it's a beach uh, in front of my beach house and I will be running at 81, staying in shape. And so that's my goal. And so basically this episode is about um, longevity, kind of the things that I'm doing, some other tips. Basically, I've got 15 tips or factors that could help you uh, to live a longer life. And so, like I say, if you're under 60 years old, it's probably not something that you've been thinking about. And I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever was really thinking about my longevity at 40 and 50 and 55 years old. But I have always worked out. I have always stayed in shape. I've always been uh, normal weight. I've never been heavy set. I've never um, been sick. I've never, um, I, I'm 61 and, and have never taken, you know, prescription medications as far as like on a, so I don't, I, I'm not on any medication. And so, uh, so I've stayed, I've tried to stay healthy, but I've never thought, okay, I'm just, I'm just staying healthy, but now I need to go up and above that, beyond that, and start doing things to increase my longevity, which would be 102 years old. And so here's some of the things that I'm doing, some of the things that have been proven to help people live longer. And, uh, I'm, and so basically, I'm at that point where what they say is I've got more years behind me than I have in front of me. But when you think about it, this is the way I'm looking at it. At 61 years old, 40 years ago, I was 21. Well, 21 is about when you really start living as an adult. So the first 20 years don't really count. So if you take 21 to 61, that's one lifetime. Well, then that means if I live to be 102, I've got a whole nother 40-year lifetime um, to live. And I don't plan on retiring. I don't plan on, uh, you know, like I say, I'm not planning on dying at 80. And so I'm looking forward to having lots of fun, lots of stuff to do, staying active for another 40 stinking years. And so if you want to come along for my ride or you want to be there with me, uh, start following some of these tips. So, uh, one of the first thing is, uh, you know, make a plan just like anything. If you're going to start a some type of business, or you're going to uh, start doing a hobby, or just about anything. If you're going on a trip, basically make a plan, get, and it doesn't have to be written down, but just get an idea of okay, what am I going to do uh, to make sure I live to be as long as possible? And so I've been forming this plan, and reading, and listening to podcasts, and watching videos, and and looking at different things. And so the first thing. Uh, you know, now that I've turned 61 and I mean, I know so many individuals that have died in the last two, three months in their forties of heart attacks, just drop dead of heart attack, no warning, nothing. And then I know a lot of people my age that have prostate cancer are getting different kinds of cancer. Uh, they've got different, uh, medical things going on, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so, I thought, well, I feel healthy and I, you know, I, I think I know my body pretty well, but you never know what's lurking or hidden there. So uh, basically everybody said, you know, you need to probably go to see a doctor. Well, so I decided because I, the, I can't even tell you the last time I went in to really have anything done at a doctor. It's been so long and I don't even really have a doctor. So I scheduled an appointment, went and saw a doctor. Uh, basically he said, okay, get some blood tests. Uh, check me out. And he said, um, you know, come back, we'll go over the blood test and then also get a, uh, a scan of your heart where they scan the uh, calcium in your heart. And so I got the calcium test. I got the blood test. I got the physical went in. And so basically all that is uh, preventative. So if you catch something early like prostate cancer or heart disease or diabetes or any of those things that end up killing people uh, a lot long a lot earlier than what they should if you catch those things early and you make lifestyle changes then they don't really affect you 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 can get past them you can you know conquer them and and some people get medications my goal is to be 
on as few medications ever as possible. So if I have a choice between a medication and a lifestyle change, I'm always going to go for the lifestyle change. And so basically got all that done. Uh, we went over the results and uh, luckily, uh, I'm going to knock on pretend wood here. Um, luckily, I at, at 61 am still healthy. Uh, you know, no signs of diabetes or high blood pressure. Uh, the only thing that that was even out of the norm was my LDL was a little high. I think, uh, you know, I think they say anything below 100 is is really good. And I was 104, so just barely out of that. Uh, my calcium test on my heart came back. Uh, again, just minor, minor amount of um, uh, calcium. Uh, and basically that's probably caused by a little bit of the LDL. And so uh, just eating... Uh, the, some of the factors that I can't control because I already, I work out already. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I'm not overweight. So all of those factors will be the first thing that a doctor will tell you, well, I've already, I'm already doing all those. So really the only thing I can do is eat better because I do not. Uh, so I'm 61, healthy, not overweight, and I eat terrible. I literally eat terrible. I do not overeat but I eat terrible. Lots of ice cream, fried food, processed food. So basically, if I start eating uh, more fruits, vegetables, nuts, and cut out uh, some of that other type of food, processed foods, I should be able to maintain that uh, calcium, if not lower that. So, so the first thing, um, so I'm going to give you a list of 15 things, uh, try to get through these. And so the number one is screenings. Uh, if you have not been to a doctor, you haven't got your colonoscopy, you haven't got your prostate, to, oh, I got my prostate uh, blood test. Um, I can, I think, uh, I think I'm a uh, point. 07 or a 0.7, basically below one. And I think uh, until you get to a, anything over a four, they start to worry about. So uh, prostate's normal. Everything's good there. But uh, those are tests that you guys should start um, having. And so I basically had all of the tests that I need at this stage. Then I'll go back and have uh, more tests a year from now. So I'll have something to compare and see how I'm doing. So number one is... Uh, get all those screenings. Um, here's a stat for you real quick. By the age of 50, by the age of 50, 90% of Americans are on pharmaceutical drugs by the age of 50. So I'm 61 and on no pharmaceutical drugs, but 90% of Americans are on some type of medication. Um, Let's see. Uh, family studies have demonstrated that only about 25% of the variation in human longevity is due to genetic factors. So what you're going to hear a lot of people saying is, oh, uh, I'm going to have a heart attack because everybody in my family, I've, you know, ha I have bad genes. Uh, well, what I've noticed in my family is I did, I do have heart disease in my family. My mom, my uncle, my dad, my granddad. Well, guess what? All of those people smoked, they ate bad, and they didn't exercise. My great-grandma, my grandma, the relatives of mine that did not smoke and were a little more active, they lived long lives. So, you know, I could say blame everything on heredity when that's not really the case. Only 25% of what happens to you is heredity, and I think it's even less than that on certain things. So... Uh, so don't blame uh, heart disease and, and all that on heredity. If you're out there exercising, not smoking, eating, taking care of yourself, you're not going to have to worry about heart disease. Um, you know, now there's going to be a few people that will, but um, the majority. So uh, annual checkups uh, enable your doctor uh, to be able to kind of gauge where you're at. And so, and that's basically why I did it. So now when I go back in a year, if anything is worse then I'll know, okay, I'm not doing enough to correct this problem. Or, but if everything's getting better, then I'll know, okay, I'm on the right track and I am uh, doing what needs to be done. So that's number one. Number two, and I think this is, uh, this is a huge factor, is uh, staying physically active. Um, they say that today, so fewer and fewer people are smoking, but more and more people are sitting, sitting in a chair 
And so we spend the majority of our life sitting in a chair at work, sitting in a chair at home, uh, watching TV, playing our video games, eating our food, driving in a car. Uh, so they're saying that health-wise, sitting in a chair is the new smoking. Uh, so whereas smoking was killing you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, now it's sitting all day is causing people to die younger uh, in the modern age because uh, they're just not physically active. And, and when I say sitting, it's sitting in a chair. Um, a lot of other countries, they squat. So uh, I, I don't know exactly where to, I guess I should put it in here. The squatting is something that I never really thought about. Um, it wasn't part of my uh, workout. So when I work out, again, it's a 90 minutes every morning, running, walking, and then I do a little bit of weightlifting every morning, which is push-ups, uh, curls with weights, uh, squats, um, some balance things. But I have incorporated squatting, and so I am able to flat foot, squat down, basically put my butt on the ground with my feet flat on the ground, my knees way up in the air. And that's how the majority of people in other countries eat or spend their day. They live in huts or, or houses without furniture. They don't need a chair to sit in to work on a computer or watch TV because they don't have those things. And so they spend a lot more time squatting on the ground. Well, that squatting helps keep your hips open, helps keep your knees strong, your thighs strong. It basically, if you're able to squat and get up, whenever you fall down, uh, so the people in other countries, when they fall, they're able to get up a lot easier than people in the United States because they have strong hips and knees and thighs and calves and feet and, and all that. So um, basically, a recent review observed that 22% lower risk of early death in individuals over 60 who exercised, even though they worked out less than the recommended 150 minutes per week. So they're saying just uh, 150 minutes per week uh, helps you out, but people even doing less than that, it really helps out. Um, people who hit the 150-minute recommendation were 28% less likely to die early. Uh, what's more, that number was 35% for those who exercise beyond this guidance. Well, I exercise well before that, uh, way above that. Um, you risk Your risk of premature death may decrease by 4% for each additional 15 minutes of daily physical activity. So uh, physical activity, being active, not sitting all day, getting up, getting in and out of your chair, going out on walks, uh, just, it doesn't, you don't have to be, you don't have to be lifting a thousand pounds and running 10 miles an hour. You just have to be moving, walk around, squat, spend some time on the floor, lay down, um, stretch, do yoga. Uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff that you guys can do. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm starting to incorporate some of these yoga type moves for balance. I want my balance to be perfect when I turn 80. I want to be able to squat on the floor, uh, touch my butt on the floor when I'm 80 and stand right back up. And so these are all things uh, I got 20 years to perfect that. I'm going to be doing that every day for 20 years. And so uh, what you need to do is um, reg regular physical activity can ex extend your lifespan, and it needs to be a part of your normal routine. So working out every morning is just a normal part of my routine. Now, I'm lucky because I work at home and I have the time to work out. Now, I'm done working out, and I get back to the house at 8 o'clock. So I go out at about, I go out at 6.20, 6.15 every morning. Uh, you know, certain parts of the year, it's completely dark outside. But, um, you know, I'm usually out and I usually return by 8 a.m. every morning. And luckily, I don't have to like hop in the shower and go to a job. I get to work from home. So, you know, I can take my shower. I usually take my shower at 10 o'clock. But uh, even if you are working a full-time job, um, either get up a little earlier, uh, take a lunch break and do some physical activity or do your physical activity after work. Um, I think studies have shown that it's easier and better to do it in the morning, but um, it doesn't matter. It, anytime you can get it in 
any time is better than not doing it at all. So, so that's number two. Uh, number three, spend time in nature or get outdoors. And so for me, uh, I have the perfect combo is I go out every morning. So number one, I get physical activity activity. Number two, I'm outdoors every day. It has to be downpour raining or there has to be, you know, inches of snow on the ground or ice bef to stop me from going out. It can be really bitterly cold and I'll still go out. And so what I get is I get the outdoors, I get the bird singing, I get the wide open spaces, I get to smell nature, I get to breathe, I get the physical activity, I get to meditate. Um, there's so many different benefits I get from going out on that walk run every morning that I, I just, if you guys would start doing it and once you started seeing the benefits, you'd probably end up being like me and not be able to get up. Other thing is I get to see a sunrise pretty much every morning. So uh, let's say we take out the days where it's um, gray skies or uh, something, you know, but I get, I probably get at least somewhere around 300 sunrises every year. And so I have probably seen more sunrises than 90% of all the people in the world. Um, and they, I mean, it's just so awe inspiring and it really helps with your meditation and your manifesting to be walking and facing the sun as it comes up every morning, seeing the beautiful sky. I take pictures of the beautiful sunrises every morning. I've got huge collections uh, of those sunrises. And so anyway, so back to spending time in nature, uh, you get vitamin D when you're out in the sunshine. Not only do you get the outdoors, you get the vitamin D, you get the exercise. Life expectancy can be increased simply by going outside and getting some sun. Uh, the vitamin D, it uh, promotes bone growth, bone remodeling, involuntary muscular uh, contractions, such as the heartbeat and digestion, and the conversion of blood glucose, uh, your sugar into energy. You get all of that by being outdoors and uh, walking in the sun. Number four, uh, this one's pretty simple, avoid overeating. And so even though I eat bad I avoid overeating. I rarely stuff myself, and I almost never do a buffet. Buffets do me no good because I would, if I go to a buffet, I usually only get one helping. There, it's like why stuff myself? I mean, it just so don't don't overeat. I think that's where a lot of people get in trouble. I mean, even if you're addicted to, um, you know, snack cakes and burgers and fries. If as long as you just eat a normal amount of that, it's better than overeating. And so, if you're eating bad but you're overeating, you're compounding um, what's going on. It's uh, the link between calorie intake and longevity currently generates a lot of interest. Um, uh, one of the things that I do, uh, one of the things that they're saying is uh, fasting is uh, is really they think beneficial because it gives your body a time period of where it's not constantly digesting food and everything. And so what I do probably 80% of the time is I skip breakfast. And so I usually eat dinner at six. I'm usually done with dinner by 7 PM every night, which means, and then I eat, I try to eat an early lunch, which is at 11, but I go from 7 PM at night all the way to 11 the next day with no food. Uh, don't eat breakfast. I don't usually eat a late night snack. Uh, and so that gives my body that fasting time. And I think that helps keep my weight under control. But uh, see if you guys can do that. Or if you can't do that, if you have to have, you know, they say breakfast is the important, most important meal of the day, blah, 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 which I don't believe. Um, I've done okay without it. Uh, I have been incorporating um, granola bars every now and then in my morning, kind of a morning snack. I you know, uh, probably need to not do that every morning and, you know, maybe two, three times a week and then fast four times a week or, or just eliminate them altogether. Uh, kind of go back and forth on that, but uh, most of the time, but I never, I don't sit down and have a big breakfast ever. If we're on vacation, sometimes I do, but then sometimes I skip lunch. Uh, but then that kind of screws up your, your long amount of fasting. Uh, lots of information on avoiding overeating, but uh, 
you're going to be better off if you allow yourself to be hungry. So it, we, every meal that you sit down at, uh, just when you think, oh, if I take two more bites, I'm going to be stuffed, stop. Leave food on the plate. Don't eat those last two bites. Walk away from the table slightly hungry rather than completely full, and uh, you'll, you'll be a lot better. And then uh, maybe give yourself, uh, you know, the latitude to have a snack maybe an hour later, maybe some walnuts or berries or, or something healthy, and that way you can incorporate some healthier food into your diet. Um, so uh, number five, eat plenty of healthy plant foods and nuts. That is something that is my major downfall is I don't eat a lot of, I eat almost no vegetables. So I'm going to try to figure out how to incorporate more vegetables. I do like fruit, so I, I'm trying to eat more fruit right now. I love nuts. I eat a lot of nuts. Uh, right now I'm trying to incorporate a lot more walnuts into my diet. And so uh, basically, uh, let's see, some studies report a 29 to 52% lower risk of dying from cancer or heart, kidney, or hormone-related diseases by incorporating more plant-based food into your diet. Um, so, yeah, just all kinds of studies on uh, eating eating healthier. Uh, but, and I, and I wouldn't say uh, get rid of all meat, Um Although I think, you know, you can be healthy eating meat or not eating meat. It just depends on how much you eat. Uh, eating, plant, eating plenty of plant foods is likely to help you live longer and lower your risk of various common diseases. Uh, nuts, like I say, are uh, rich in protein, fiber, antioxidants, and beneficial plant compounds. A uh, great uh, source of vitamins and minerals such as copper, magnesium, potassium, folate, niacin, and B6 and E. Several studies show that nuts have beneficial effects on heart disease, blood pressure, inflammation, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, belly fat levels, and even some forms of cancer. One study found that people who consumed at least three servings of nuts per week had a 39% lower risk of premature death. And if you guys research this stuff, there's just study after study after study. Um, recent uh, two recent interviews included 350,000 people. They noted that one serving of nuts per week resulted in 4%, and one serving of nuts per day resulted in 27% decrease risk of all-cause mortality and decreased risk of CVD mortality. Adding nuts to your daily routine will keep you healthy and make you live longer. So I uh, hope I'm not talking too fast trying to get through this. Don't want to bore you guys. Uh, this one's pretty easy. I won't go into a whole lot of detail. But uh, number six, don't smoke. I've never been a smoker. And so, uh, I mean, I know that a lot of my family members have died young because they smoked. My mom had to have a, a triple bypass because she smoked. She smoked a lot. She did quit smoking after her triple bypass, and she did live to be 81 years old. So that's what's uh, that's what's kind of interesting. Uh, my father-in-law also smoked. They were both overweight. It's interesting that they both made it to 81 years old. That's why, for me, the thought of making it to 102 is pretty simple because they made it to 81, no exercise, overweight, out of shape, smoked, sat in a chair, I'm maintaining my health, active, no smoking, and so I should be running easily at 81 and, and be able to make it to 102, barring any of those other things. So um, just looking at that, that's why I think uh, I've got a, I, anybody out there, I think you guys, everybody has a, a chance um, of living a lot longer life, even if you just add five or 10 years um, if you have a happy life and you're enjoying life and you like to be with friends and family, it's worth it. Uh, we'll get into some of this other, if you're bored, if you're lonely, you know, maybe you don't want to live that long. Uh, so at number seven, well, let's see, let me go back to cigarettes real quick. Smoking, um, one study reports that individuals who quit smoking by age 35 may prolong their lives up to eight and a half years. Uh, quit smoking in your 60s may add up to 3.7 years to your life. Um, 
so lots, I think we all know that smoking is bad for you. Uh, causes uh, cancer and heart disease. Uh, it, that's just not even a question anymore. So people who smoke may lose up to 10 years of life and be three times more likely to die prematurely than those who never pick up a cigarette. So for you smokers, um, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Your chance of longevity is pretty small, although then there are all those people that live to be 100 years old and say they smoked every day and drank a glass of whiskey every day and they made it. So that, I think that's where her, her, heredity comes into factor. Uh, number seven, moderate your alcohol intake. And so this is going to be a two-part uh, thing. Basically, don't drink hard liquor a whole bunch. I mean, don't consume a lot of alcohol. It uh, will mess with your liver, your heart, your uh, pancreas. Uh, you'll get pancreatic disease. It will increase... Um, and all the other stuff. Um, now, if you have a moderate consumption, um, you know, it, it, it still uh, can increase um, your chances of some of those uh, morbidities. Wine is considered particularly beneficial due to its high content of poly, uh, polyphenol uh, antioxidants. So uh, they do suggest that a glass of wine every now and then uh, is not going to hurt. And actually, they say drinking one to two glasses of alcohol a day may reduce your risk of heart disease and stroke by 25 to 40 percent. Now, that's if you're having wine. Um, it lowers your cortisol levels and helps ease the stress of your day. But don't overdo it. Uh, if you drink too much, then you start getting into where uh, it is hurting you. So uh, don't go out and, if you're not drinking, don't go out and start drinking uh, wine just because you think it's going to help you. I think the benefits are going to be more by not drinking at all than by having a glass of wine every day. Now, having a glass, you know, maybe one or two glasses of wine a week uh, might be the optimal solution to that. Uh, number eight, prioritize your happiness. Uh, have a positive attitude. So... I always, for some reason, have a positive attitude, I'm happy most all of the time. Part of that comes from being out every morning. Uh, I manifest that I want to be happy every morning. I manifest every morning that I'm going to live to be 102. I manifest every morning that I'm going to be running at the age of 81. And so I 100% believe in manifesting, whether it works or not, it doesn't matter because I think it works, and if I think it works, it's a placebo, and it works, which means it does work. And so I've seen too many things that I have manifested uh, come to fruition, and so I manifest that I want to have a positive attitude, that I'm happy, and so um, feeling happy can significantly increase your longevity. In fact, happier individuals had a 3.7% reduction in early death over a five-year study period. Um, those who felt happiest at 22 years of age were two and a half times more likely to still be alive six decades later. Uh, a review of 35 studies showed that happy people may live up to 18% longer than their less happy counterparts. So uh, find ways of uh, getting happy. Number nine, avoid chronic stress and anxiety. Uh, stress and anxiety. Stress is a huge factor in uh, heart attacks, stroke, uh, cancers, things like that. A lot of that comes with being happy. Um, just try to reduce stress in your life. If you're uh, stressed on your job, please figure out a way of finding another job that you enjoy. You should enjoy going to your job. You spend the majority of your adult life at work. So if you don't like your work, I can understand why you're not happy. So find a job that makes you happy. That's going to really help uh, with your stress and your anxiety. If you're in a relationship that gives you a lot of anxiety or stress, uh, please get out. Uh, find a way out of it or find a way to make it less stressful. Um, studies show that pessimistic individuals are 42% higher risk of early death than more optimistic people. Uh so anyway, uh, reduce that chronic stress and anxiety. Number 10, nurture your social circle. So basically, 
Um, keep networking with people, keep talking to people, keep going out and having dinners with people. Uh, researchers report that maintaining healthy social networks can improve your odds of survival by 50%. And that has to do with uh, being lonely. If you don't have these, uh, if you're not out being social and have these networks and talking to people, you become lonely. Lonely leads to sadness, which leads to depression, which leads to stress, which leads to heart disease, stroke, cancer, uh, death. And so having just three social ties may decrease your risk of early death by more than 200%. Percent, uh, just study after study after study. A strong social circle might also help you re uh, act less negatively to stress. Perhaps further explaining the positive effect on lifespan. One study reports that providing support to others may be more beneficial than receiving it. So if you know somebody that's lonely, uh, go spend time with them. It's not only going to help them; it's going to help you. Number 11, live with purpose. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, know that there's something to look forward to. I, What I try to do in my life is I got this huge one-year calendar I put on the wall, and I plan adventures and trips and things months and months out. And that way, when I look at that calendar every day, I know I've got something to look forward to, a friend, an old friend that I'm going to go spend time with, uh, family members that we're going to go on vacation with, always... Or, or projects that I'm working on, um, always have something to look forward to. When you wake up in the morning, just know that there's something there. It's about knowing what your role is in your family, your community, your job, uh, feeling fulfilled in that. Uh, so uh, basically just have gratitude and perspective on the stuff that you're doing, and uh, living with purpose will help you live longer. Number 12, this one's a little odd, but drink coffee or tea. Now, I drink tea. I think green tea is the beneficial tea. Tea is basically all I drink. I do not drink coffee. I don't, eat, I don't drink that much alcohol, um, and I don't drink a huge amount of water. I drink, and I do not drink pop. I uh, haven't had any pop in decades, and so tea is my... A drink of choice. I think I'm going to start incorporating more green tea with my black tea, if not mixing the two, so I get uh, uh, a little bit of that. But uh, both coffee and tea are linked to decreased risk of chronic disease. Um, like I said, green tea is one of the better things. It may decrease your risk of cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. Coffee is linked to lower risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and certain cancers and brain ailments such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, both coffee and tea drinkers benefit from a 20 to 30% lower risk of early death compared to non-drinkers. Uh, but remember that too much caffeine can also lead to anxiety and insomnia, so you may want to curb your intake and recommend a limit of 400 milligrams per day or around four cups of coffee. Um, it's worth noting that it generally takes six hours for caffeine's effects to subside. Therefore, you don't want to drink coffee or tea too late in the evening, but I drink tea um, all night long uh, right before I go to bed. Uh, that will be one, one of my other things that I fail on. I do not get uh, the recommended seven to eight hours of sleep. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so number 13, develop a good, oh, here we go, uh, develop a good sleeping pattern. Uh, I, I have a great sleeping pattern as far as um, I go to bed at about 1230. Because it's so late, I'm tired. I go to bed all pretty much immediately sleep throughout the night. I get up at, um, five 47. So I usually get six, five and a half, six hours of sleep. Um, and so I, but I've got a definite routine, which makes it easy to fall asleep. Now I'm not getting enough sleep. And so that would be my downfall. Uh, not getting enough sleep, uh, is not good. Let's see. Sleeping less than five to seven hours per night is linked to a 12% greater risk of early death while sleeping more than eight to nine hours per night could also, oh, well, you don't want to, and then you, yeah, so sorry about that. Um, so sleeping too little or sleeping too much, uh, can be detrimental. If you sleep more 
than eight to nine hours a night, you could decrease your lifespan by up to 38%. So what they say there is if you're sleeping too much, maybe that's because you're depressed, you're lonely, you don't have anything to look forward to. So uh, basically the sweet spot is seven to eight hours per night. Um, uh, Get in there and uh, too little sleep may promote inflammation, increase your risk of diabetes, heart disease, obesity, um, and so um, develop a sleep routine that includes seven to eight hours of sleep each night. Uh, if you have the same routine, uh, don't go to bed with the TV on. Don't look at your phone right before you go to bed. Uh, I, the easiest way for me to go to bed these days is complete darkness, no TV. I use a sound machine, uh, the fan sound, and keep the room cool and I go right to sleep. So number 14, uh, you normally won't see this on many lists. Uh, I am married to a dental hygienist, and so I know the importance of this, but oral health. Now think about it. Think about maybe your relatives, your parents. I know my mom, uh, basically being uh, the age that she is, she lost most of her teeth and had to have um, dentures, and so we got implants. She was never, ever happy with the implants. They always hurt her gums. She couldn't get them to stay in. Uh, They were nothing but a pain. So number one, if you have good oral health until you get old, number one, you're going to be able to eat easier um, because your teeth are going to be working. But um, uh, it's the whole bacteria in your mouth thing too. Uh, Oral health is important Uh, With over 600 types of bacteria living in our mouths at any one time, it's critical to practice regular oral hygiene. If you guys aren't brushing your teeth, brush your teeth two times a day, three times a day, and floss after every meal. I don't floss, but I have these these plastic things that go in between your teeth. I literally can't eat a meal and not clean my teeth almost immediately or it drives me crazy if I feel food in between my teeth. So just getting that food out from between your teeth keeps it from turning into bacteria, which then forms these 600 different bacteria that can make you sick. Um, Unchecked oral bacteria can lead to gum disease, which can make it easier for your gums to start bleeding. If you go to the dental hygienist and she cleans your teeth and your gums are bleeding all over the place, you're not flossing. Here's a little tip. If you will floss and use those picks and clean your teeth and your gums after every meal every day, when you go to the dental hygienist, it will not hurt nearly as bad and you will not bleed when she cleans your teeth. Um, pay attention to your oral health, uh, positive impacts, uh, levels of toxicity and inflammation in your body will be lower. Inflammation loads your heart and cardiovascular system. Um, you can be resistant to dementia and it's also, uh, for the ladies, uh, good oral hygiene is uh, better pregnancy health. So try to floss, brush, uh, multiple times a day. And uh, that was number 14. So here we are to number 15, keep learning. And so this kind of goes into that dementia uh, aspect. You don't want to, we're all going to start to kind of forget things as we get older, but keep your mind sharp by doing puzzles, by reading, by thinking, by trying to figure things out, by learning. Learning is a big thing. Uh, Mental stimulation is important for cognitive health. Engage in lifelong learning, whether it's through reading puzzles, uh, learning a new skill or hobbies. Um, Yeah, just try not to be, I know uh, a lot of older people get stuck in that chair, that rocking chair in front of uh, one of the news channels, and they just are spoon-fed news over and over and over. And uh, that is what we call, folks, brainwashing. And so if you're old and you're listening to this and you're believing all the news on one of those uh, cable news stations, you are being brainwashed because it is not true, uh, either side. So I am warning you. So basically, um, that's all I have here on my list. But again, uh, just to go over that, uh, now that I'm 60, parents are gone, starting to think about longevity. Um, I started, I had kids when I was 39 and 40, and so I knew that for me to be active 
as they get older and have grandkids, which is going to be later in my life, I'm going to need to stay physically fit. So that was another reason that I decided I need to start checking on this longevity. So I am 61 years old, and both of my girls are still in college. So, you know, they're not even close to being married yet, and I'm not close to grandkids yet. And so, you know, let's say they get married and have kids like maybe five, um, 10 years, you know, I'll be, you know, 66 or 70 years old. And so I still want to be active for my grandkids and to go on vacation and, and to do things like that. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, keeping my weight down, staying physically fit, uh, having a positive attitude, dressing the way that I dress. I try to dress comfortable the way that I feel good. Um, but I don't, I don't, I haven't fallen into the pattern of, oh, you're 60, you need to start dressing like a 60 year old. Well, if you start dressing and acting like a 60 year old, people are going to treat you like a 60 year old. Most of the people that I tell that I'm 61 that don't know me are always very surprised. Everybody usually puts me probably at 51. Uh, so uh, most of the time I'm usually thought of as being 10 years younger than what I am. And so hopefully when I reach 81, people will only think that I'm 71. But anyway, that is uh, my thoughts. Uh, again, um, using manifestation, uh, using that um, positive energy in the mornings, when I'm out meditating, out on the trail. For me, that's the number one thing. I mean, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything in life better than what I'm doing every morning, which is getting out and exercising. I'm outdoors every morning. I'm seeing a sunrise, which is giving me happiness. I'm meditating and manifesting, which is, uh, you know, giving me that positive attitude um, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking of things, which hopefully is giving me, you know, that cognitive thing. So there's so many different things that just that hour and a half every morning is benefiting me. Uh, it's part of my fasting instead of eating a big breakfast, I'm out there exercising. Um, I just, I just wish everybody, uh, had the ability or would start doing that. I think you guys would really love that. So anyway, there is my episode on longevity and trying to make it to be a hundred and two years old. You guys can hit me up at Curtis at Curtis Tucker.com or shags at shaggy duck.com. Go to my website, Curtis Tucker.com. Uh, you guys can, um, check out the blog, the podcast and the videos there. You can catch these videos, this video here. If you're listening to the podcast, there is a video of it, uh, at youtube.com slash Curtis Tucker. If you guys are watching this vlog on video and you want to listen to my podcast, um, you know, when you can't look at the camera, like say you're driving, uh, you can pick up my podcast at pretty much all of the major podcasting platforms. Uh, it's called A Shaggy Life. And I think right now I might not be on... Google has changed from their Google podcast platform to YouTube, and I'm not sure that I've got everything... Uh, set up yet. So I might not be on there, but uh, this podcast is hosted on Buzzsprout. And so I am on Buzzsprout, but again, I'm also on Apple and all the other great podcasting platforms. So anyway, I appreciate you guys, you shagheads, you guys email me. I want to hear from you guys and I appreciate, appreciate you guys again. Everybody have a great uh, day and uh, listen to some vinyl and I will talk to you guys soon. See ya.